Hello everybody, this is Lori Anderson, contributor for FreedomOutpost.com. I want to address several things with you today that I believe are imperative to helping to save our union, to helping to educate our people, and to let people know just why it is so imperative. We all know that there is a corrupt judicial system that is running rampant throughout this country. And there is only one way to stop it, and that is with we the people, the knowledge, and the education. So I wrote an article which was extremely deep in my heart, and I feel like it is something that we need to address as individuals, which is self-reflection. Do you believe in innocent until proven guilty? Do you truly believe that? Or do you believe in guilty until proven innocent? Now, a lot of people say they believe in innocent until proven guilty. However, with all of the propaganda and the false teachings and, and the bombardment between social media or mainstream media, or the school system, the police uh, departments, the federal government, they have all pushed for many years for people to believe in guilty until proven innocent. And many of us, on an individual basis, sometimes actually do follow that exact mentality without even realizing it. I'm going to go over my article, and then I'm going to go over some really important facts. You know, a lot of people say, well, they took the plea bargain. They said that they did it, so they're guilty. I think the statistics that I will be sharing with you today after my article may just change your mind and make you realize just how corrupt and twisted this system has become. And it has become detrimental to our people, our families, our union, and it is destroying everything, everything about our union. Turning the tide is society to blame. Our republic was based upon a principle that dates back to biblical times. Many people use the quote, innocent until proven guilty, but is that really the case? Do you really believe and live that statement? Let's find out by putting you to the biggest test of all, self-reflection. In this test, you will answer to yourself. So make sure that you are brutally honest, because if you can't be honest with yourself, all people, including you, have already lost the battle. Taking a hard look in the mirror of self-reflection. You will unveil if you believe in innocent until proven guilty, or if you have been brainwashed to believe in social justice, also known as guilty until proven innocent, while expecting the opposite for yourself. This backwards and upside down mentality of guilty until proven innocent has and is destroying millions of lives as well as our union it is time that we take a deep look within ourselves. Only by a deep reflection of ourselves will we be able to pull back the mask of injustice, change the tide of corruption, and restore our republic. In order to restore our union's founding principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we must first begin by being honest with ourselves. Then, and only then, will America have a chance at prosperity for all once again. So how do you respond? What is your thought pattern? What is your reaction or actions when you hear or read certain articles? Be sure to include reflecting about your online posts. What comments do you make and how do you respond on what you've heard? Using some articles from mainstream media and some other examples, I will list questions for you to ask yourself. There's no need to answer in the comment section below unless you choose to do so. The intent of this article is simply self-awareness and to help our union by educating people 
of the wrongs being enacted by society as a whole. More often than not, people are judging and have the mindset of guilty until proven innocent without even realizing they are doing it. They have been propagandized, manipulated, and ultimately trained into this type of thinking. Creating self-awareness is the only way that all of our people will truly regain their rights and once again become a union of truly free people. So let's read the following article. Alan Espinosa was charged with murder of girlfriend. CBS News, New York, reported Hempstead man faces murder charge and girlfriend's stabbing death. You see his booking photo as they parade it on the mainstream media. A Long Island man is accused of stabbing his girlfriend to death during an argument over the weekend. Alan R. Espinosa, 26, of Hempstead, is charged with second-degree murder and fourth-degree criminal possession of a weapon in the death of 24-year-old Neven Espinon. Nassau County Police Detective Sergeant Jates Spokick said Monday that the couple got into an argument which turned violent. The argument escalated to where Allen did stab the victim in the throat and neck, Sopic said. A roommate found Espanol's body around 4 p.m. on Saturday. Espinosa was arrested early Sunday morning and was scheduled to be arraigned Monday in First District Court in Hempstead. Sopic and Espinosa and Espanol had been dating for a couple of months and had been living together for approximately four weeks. Okay, so this is their report. What are the first thoughts that pop into your mind? How do you feel about this report? So with that being read, which one of the following would you check? What is the first thought that came to your mind? A. This man is a scumbag that needs the death penalty. B. You start resharing the story while attacking this man as being scum that the world can do without. C. If the cops arrested him, then they must have proof that he committed the crime. Thus, the cops are theorized for getting this person like this off the streets. D. Where's the proof? What evidence did they have? What is the accused saying? E. If they plead the fifth, then they definitely have something to hide. F. They have every right to plead the fifth, and the government must prove this man is guilty beyond the shadow of a doubt. Otherwise, he must be found innocent of all charges brought against him. If you answered A, B, C, or E, you are the problem. You have convicted a person without any proof, without due process, and without the assumption that people are innocent until proven guilty. In this article, which I will include behind, underneath in my YouTube, for you to be able to read the entire thing, I've included quite a lot of different mainstream media examples, including an Albuquerque man accused of rape of a four-month-old baby, school bus driver accused of rape, law firm employee arrested for and charged with tax evasion, dozens arrested during Brooklyn Bridge protest, U.S. confiscates property of suspected drug dealer. So I will fast forward through this and you can click on the article to see the full question so you can do your self-reflection. I'll continue. The thought pattern of guilty until proven innocent within society is causing and has caused many innocent people to go to jail and or prison. This thought pattern is exactly what has fed the beast at the fictitious courts to be able to lie, manipulate, twist, and abuse everyone's natural right to a fair trial, which you and everyone else had from the very first breath you took. Sadly, society today would have also crucified Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ chose to remain silent when questioned by Pontius Pilate, 
and he too was judged by those corrupt, hate-filled, power elite that were the religious leaders at that time and was brutally crucified. Innocent blood was spilled all in the name of social justice. You can refer to Matthew chapter 27, King James Version, Jesus Christ remained silent. Then we hear of a, when we hear of a murderer or rapist, it elicits a certain automatic response without any rational thought pattern involved. Our human nature kicks in, anger ensues, and we automatically seek justice through vengeance. Not because it is true justice, but because of our emotions and not facts. This stems from the fact that rapist or murderer elicit one image in our minds, while the coding system can and does define those terms much differently. Thus, what you may be thinking is rape or murder may in fact be self-defense or consensual sex between two people that's, that the state itself doesn't approve of. Let me give you some biblical examples, and let's start healing our union, our people, and throwing the judicial tyranny and private prison sham out of the window. The Apostle Paul, known as one of the greatest apostles of Jesus Christ, was once named Saul. Saul persecuted many innocent Christians, including causing them to be put to death. Saul, also known as Paul, was greatly feared among the Christians due to his persecution of them. On the road to Damascus, Saul was blinded by the Lord, spoken to, and transformed from an evil person with murder in his heart to one of the most well-known apostles of Jesus Christ that went from place to place preaching the word of God and healing the sick. You can use the reference, Saul was renamed Paul, Acts chapter 9, King James Version. This is a biblical fact. Let's contrast the place and place that same scenario in today's society. How would our society work today? Much in reverse, honestly. The law enforcement officers would arrest Saul, also known as Paul. He would have a mock trial then caged the rest of his life, if not murdered by the state and others seeking to judge him for his horrible acts. The same state in which the defense and the prosecution, also known as judges, prosecutors, officers, public defenders, and police, are all paid by and work for the same corporation or people. Their loyalty is only to those whom pay their paychecks, which are the corporations and not we the people. When people are found guilty by an uninformed jury of the state's peers and not the defendant's peers, is there any doubt that there is no fair trial? How can there be a fair trial when the judge, prosecution, and public defender are all paid by the same corporation? Their job is to protect their client, and their client is the one that pays their paychecks. The deck is already stacked against anyone whom goes into the courtroom today due to this fact. Does that sound like due process to you? Does it even sound plausible that anyone can have a fair trial and due process with a system that is completely stacked against the accused? What about those rapists? The state twists the real meaning of rape to include sex with a child. Before you think, oh my God, this lady supports pedophiles and rapists, etc., please hear me out and you will see that that is not what I am saying at all. However, in all fairness, many men and women are being convicted because of false definition of rape and society's blind ignorance of thinking that they have the right to rule others' lives and judge a situation without knowing all of the facts. On that note, I am going to once again go back to the Word of God and, in contrast, compare with our society of today. In the days of Lot, he and his two daughters were dwelling in a mountain cave. The two daughters conspired together to get their father drunk so that they could have sex with him in order to become pregnant with child. Lot's daughters made him drink wine, and after Lot was drunk, the oldest daughter went to her father, had sex with him, all, while, all the while he was not aware that any of this had happened. On the next night, the same actions were repeated by the youngest daughter. 
She also had sex with her father without his consent or knowledge. <clears throat> the daughters both became pregnant by their father, Lot. You can find the reference to that in Genesis 19, verses 30 through 39. Lot was not charged with any crime, and nor were the girls. God did not strike him dead, nor curse Lot for the actions that had occurred. There was no intent by Lot to have sex with his daughters. However, there definitely was intent and pre-planning of taking advantage of Lot by his daughters. So let's revert to today. If the same situation were to happen today, because of society's twisted thinking, Lot would have been arrested, thrown in jail, and the state would throw away the key. The people in society today would attack him in the media, destroy his reputation, and would not believe that Lot could not have known he was having sex. The state would twist the events, creating a scenario from lies and manipulation to make people believe Lot was guilty of rape. The false course system would paint him as a monster that raped his own daughters, forced them to bear his children, and they would make sure to have DNA of the babies to, quote, prove their rape allegations. The defense that Lot didn't even know and was drunk wouldn't matter in today's society. In the eyes of many, there is no excuse for such things within our society. And thus, they think it is proper to force their opinions and redefine definitions upon others. They have, men they have the mentality that you will live how I say, or you'll be locked in a cage like an animal for the rest of your life for not obeying the command of another fallible man or woman. And just who did they think they are? The politicians, society, and lawmakers have redefined rape to the point that it has nothing to do with force or coercion, but it is whatever they say it is. We've allowed a corrupt system to infiltrate our country, rewrite definitions, and accepted their twisted version of truth. Thus, being complicit in destroying many innocent people's lives by sending them to prison for something that truly was not a crime. Where there is no victim, there is no crime. Just because a girl or a boy is underage does not mean that they are not complicit in sex. Many are more than complicit, and the false narrative that they can't consent due to their age is not only false, but a product of brainwashing in society as a whole. Many of our youth today seek sexual gratification and will do anything within their power to get it. Then when they're caught, the man or the woman that was targeted by the child is set up to be a rapist, according to the system. When in truth, the adult targeted, not the child, is the real victim and facts be damned now i want to make something clear i'm obviously not talking about a five-year-old child but let's get real you have these teenagers and you have these pre-teenagers that are involved in sex and everything else they're being taught it in public schools they're being taught it by planned parenthood they're being pushed into a sexual drive they're being given free condoms. They're being allowed to have abortions. So they're allowed to have birth control. They're allowed to consent to birth control. They're allowed to consent to free condoms. They're allowed to consent to have an abortion and kill another human being, but they're not allowed to consent to sex. That is not only hypocritical, it is nothing but a setup in order to encage tons of people with a false narrative. These are just two examples that I bring to the forefront because these are the same types of crimes which infuriate many today. Many people judge upon what a person is being accused of or what is in the headline instead of judging by any of the facts of the case they see before them. We must realize that we ourselves are the ones bringing damnation upon our country, our families, and our friends by having the mentality of guilty until proven innocent instead of innocent until proven guilty. 
because we saw it on the news, it must be new, true, right? Not so much. Major failures found in Rolling Stones rape on campus. Revisiting the Tawana Brawley rape scandal. Pay up time for Brawley rape hoaxer finally shells out for slander. Yes, people, these quote unquote children across this nation falsely state rape. And depending on what state you're in, it is amazing what they consider quote unquote rape. And it has nothing to do with coercion, has nothing to do with force, it has all to do with the number. Many people have the automatic reaction of anger when they hear these types of crimes via mainstream media or police reports. Because these stories are so forward, we do not even stop to consider or question if the mainstream media would twist, manipulate, or lie to we the people in order to sell more newspapers, get more ratings, instigate people to create an outrage so that the people cry out for quote-unquote social justice and not justice itself. Or would they? You bet they would. They do. They have. They've been complicit in destroying many, many, many people's lives because of their false and misleading reporting. The Paris, Paris mayor, I'm suing Fox News over false report on Muslim no-go zones. Major failures found in Rolling Stones rape on campus report. George Zimmerman sues NBC Universal over edited 911 call. I don't know if you remember this. But that is huge. Mainstream media cut out and edited massive portions of the George Zimmerman 911 call in order to make it seem as if he was racist. Why am I stressing on that one over all the different ones that I have listed here? Because that caused deaths around the nation. It caused deaths around the nation. Many white people were targeted and shot over this case because of the quote unquote social justice. They didn't care about any of the facts. Mainstream media manipulated the 911 call in order to promote a enraged public, and it worked. And no one has been held accountable for those individuals who died because of this. What about the police? Many have learned the thought pattern that it is, that has been ingrained into us throughout our entire lives. It's been done through the courts, police, propaganda, public schools, newspapers, churches, and non-government organizations. We have been taught to never question government authority. We are taught that police and judges, etc., are always the good guys. They would never lie. They would never set people up. And because it's in the police report, it must be true, right? We've been taught to believe that a police officer would never lie, twist, or manipulate a police report to make it fit the narrative that he or she chooses. My friends, our founding fathers always questioned those in authority because they knew how corrupt those in authority can be and the destruction that comes with it. Police officers, judges, prosecutors, and all the above are only human beings wearing a uniform. They are still human. And you have corruption running rampant in our country. So I provided a link of color of law abuses from the FBI. During 2012, 42% of the FBI, and yes, you heard that right, 
10% of the FBI's total civil rights caseload involved color of law issues. By the way, if you want to know what the color of law code is, it's 18 U.S. 242 and 18 U.S. 241. There were 380 color of law cases open during the year. Most of the cases involved crimes that fell into five broad areas. Excessive force, sexual assaults, false arrest and fabrication of evidence, deprivation of property, and failure to keep from harm. Now, I don't know if, if you noticed this, but when a police officer actually rapes somebody, and I am not talking about sleeps with somebody, I'm talking about actually by force rapes somebody, do you notice it's called sexual assault instead of rape? Has anybody else noticed that? Why? Because the sexual assault is a much less time in prison than rape. Yet, for your normal person, rape can be defined as consensual sex as long as the quote-unquote child is under the age of what they say can consent. Okay, so I have included plenty of proof of some of these violations of color of law violations. Police officers were found guilty for conspiracy against rapes. SFPD officer was found guilty of illegal search and falsifying police reports. Yes, they do falsify police reports all the time. They falsify those reports to fit their narrative and truth be damned. Two East Haven cops guilty of civil rights abuses. Four formal correctional officers sentenced for assault of inmates and ensuing a cover-up. No, you don't say. They wouldn't cover up that stuff, would they? Crime, corruption, and cover-ups in the Chicago Police Department. Two Detroit police officers pled guilty in federal corruption probe. Jury gives $1 million to a man who sued the city for false police charges. Wrongfully convicted woman. Now free sues the city of L.A. And I want to point that out. Wrongfully convicted. She was convicted and spent time in prison for a crime she did not commit. And we, the people, are the only ones who can stand in the gap and protect our people from this out-of-control regime, and we cannot do it without being educated and knowing how to protect our people. You want to know why houses, the, the, the families are being destroyed? Why so many families are broken up? Why so many kids are running the streets? The families are being destroyed because we have over 2 million people in the population sitting in prison. We have the highest prison population in the world, and we are supposed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Reference Romans 3, 20 through 31. In God's eyes, all sin is equal and will cause eternal damnation. You can find that referenced in Revelation 21, verse 8, Revelation 22, verse 11 through 17. Judge not for what you judge with you shall be judged. The problem with society as a whole is we are very quick to judge and condemn others while we expect fairness, mercy, truth, understanding, as well as benefit of the doubt from others for ourselves. Hypocrites is what many in this nation have become without even being aware of their own hypocrisy. Reference John 8, verse 7. We've shown as a nation we no longer wish to follow 
the Christian principles in which our country was founded upon, and have become a nation of hypocritical many judges following the orders of an elite group that creates, quote, rules out of thin air pushed upon the people by corporations without the people's permission. I challenge you to find an enacting clause for your states, one of your states, ORC, one of your states' codes. If you find it, please let me know. An enacting clause is what makes it actual law. The people, meaning the jury, are then used to enforce these codes or rules upon the unsuspecting populace via an uninformed jury. Thus, in turn, you target yourselves and you enforce that which is not lawful on others because the court tells you that this is the, quote, law. And you have to convict if a person violated one of these rules or codes. Code is not law. Provide me the enacting clause that makes it law, and I will retract that statement. If we continue feeding this out of control, fictitious judicial system, we all lose. Is this being done for society, safety, or truth? I think not. But only for vengeance sought by and enforced by the uninformed. All while the big bankers, private prisons, law enforcement agencies, courts, prosecutors' offices, and attorneys are benefiting by this forced slavery of our people, collecting an endless supply of money flowing into their bank accounts. This de facto system is benefiting by enslaving humanity in a box of steel. Our families, communities, and states are destroyed by lack of compassion and morals. In turn, society wonders why there are so many broken homes, so many out-of-control youth, and so much violence. If we as a people would do as we are supposed to do, see people as innocent until proven guilty, as well as judge those, quote, codes, what they call law, society would not be as broken. We could begin to heal our union. Yet we as a union not only accept this unlawful tyranny, but encourage it while complaining about unfairness for ourselves. Please check out plea bargaining in the United States. The jury's duties and responsibilities are to protect the people against government overreach. It is not only the jury's duty to judge on the case itself, but also to judge the code, what they call law that the person or persons are being charged with. When you know what your duty, your rights, and responsibilities are as a juror, you have indeed become a true protector of the people. Thus, in turn, you're protecting your own self, your family, your neighbors, and your community. I've given links to the Fully Informed Jury Association, Founding Father John Adams Notes on the Right of Jury Nullification, and more helpful information to be able to educate yourself. The United States has an estimated prison population of 1,574,700 prisoners as of December 31, 2013. This does not include jails, juvenile detention centers, and it does not include CPS where the children are in, have been taken away and placed in someone else's home. References Bureau of Justice Statistics. How many of those individuals did not receive a fair trial? How many prisoners today are locked away in prison due to a plea bargain deal, which is almost always under threat of more time or her charges if they don't take the plea deal, duress because they've been locked up longer than allowed and feel there's no other way out, or coercion? 98% of all cases are plea bargains in the United States of America today. These plea bargains are many times only agreed to because a person, even those that are innocent, are told that they can choose. But if they choose the jury trial, they will get 100 years. Or if you sign this agreement, we'll only keep you in prison for 20. That is not a choice. That is entrapment, especially when it is already known and explained earlier 
there's no true fair for all today up here in my article for a moment and I want to show you something that may be an eye-opener for you in this part of the discussion because many people feel like well they pled guilty or they fled out yeah well let's go over here and and this right here is a journalist resource research on today's news topics okay this is the criminal justice one that is dated january 15th 2015 and the topic is false confessions new data and law enforcement interrogations research findings i will obviously include the links for each one of these sources so that you are able to pull them up under this youtube Researchers have been increasingly focused on science behind interrogation techniques and confessions and emergence and emerging criminal justice system data patterns with the hope of better understanding how false confessions are produced and how to limit the chances innocent persons are in prison. The topic of false confessions has again come into the public eye as the University of Michigan and Northwestern University Law Schools continue to compile data as part of the new National Registry of Exonerations. Scholars with that project note in 2013 report for homicide exonerations, the leading cause of false confession is perjury or false accusations, mostly deliberate misidentifications. Homicide cases also include high rate of official misconduct and 74 percent do you hear that 74 percent of all false confessions in the database that only leaves 26 percent As the Wall Street Journal noted September the 8th of 2013 report, National Registry of Exoneration Statistics suggests that young people in particular are more prone to admitting guilt for crimes they did not commit. 38% of exonerations for crimes allegedly committed by a youth under 18 in the last quarter century involved false confessions. Reporter Zusha Elson writes, quote, compared with 11% for adults, according to the new database, of 1,155 individuals who were wrongly convicted and later cleared of all charges, unquote. Indeed, in California, which faces severe prison overcrowding issues, there's been a debate about these new policies that specifically address the issue of coerced confessions by young people. Let's make no mistake, it's not just the young people. Data produced through experiments are also providing new insights. For example, a 2013 study published in Law and Human Behavior, Innocence and Resisting Confession During Interrogation effects on sociologic activity, performs experiments on innocent subjects to look at the biological realities of being questioned and how stress affects those being interrogated. The findings suggest that innocent suspects underestimate the threat of interrogation and that resisting pressures to confess can diminish the suspect's sociological resources and lead to false confessions. The study authors Max Gould, Stephanie Madden, Huron Yang, Daniel Lanin of Iowa State University, Culture of, Sh of Central Missi Michigan University, and Sarah Greathouse of the Rand Corporation also include. Do you notice Rand Corporation is even in this? The current findings show the state of being actually innocent produces an 
immediate and fundamental difference in suspects that could set in motion an array of ill-advised decisions and behaviors that could put innocent suspects' long-term outcomes in jeopardy. It should be noted that the initial psychologic differences associated with innocence and guilt are not necessarily important in and of themselves, but rather are significant because they reflect critical initial differences between the innocent and guilty in how they differently construe the same situation. The smaller sociologic reactions of innocent occurring response to being accused and interrogated signal the experience of less stress, indicating that they perceive themselves to be at less risk a perception that would discourage taking strong self-protective actions, such as invoking one's right to silence and counsel. Conventional wisdom maintains that the, quote, bluff, unquote, an interrogation technique in which investigators state that they have potentially damning evidence, but do not claim that this evidence implicates the accused is of little concern to innocent, falsely accused, but can frighten the guilty into confessing. According to the Innocence Project, however, approximately 25% of convicted criminals ultimately exonerated had, in fact, confessed to the crime. As The Economist notes, a 2015 study published in Psychological Science finds evidence that under lab conditions, people can come to visualize and recall detailed false memories of engaging in criminal behavior. Not only could the young adults in our, sem in our sample be led to generate such memories, but the rate of false recollection was high, and the memories themselves were richly detailed. Additionally, false memories for perpetrating crime showed signs that they may have been generated in a way that is similar to the way in which false memories for non-criminal emotional memories are generated. False memories for committing crime also share many characteristics with true memories. So, I'm not going to continue to read on this. However, it is extremely important that we understand there's a lot more people who are in prison that are innocent, even though they confessed than were actually proven guilty. They weren't proven guilty. They were threatened under duress or coercion. You can believe it. I've also got information on Daniel Anderson exonerated after 27 years in prison. This man's life was stolen. His entire life destroyed. And he was innocent. Edward McGinnis exonerated after 27 years in prison. Joel Fowler exonerated. All these individuals, and there's many, 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 many more. I guess the real thought pattern needs to be for you to stop in self reflection and ask if it was you. Would that be okay? Because I know that this right here is not okay with me. And I don't care if 10 guilty people have to go free in order to make sure one innocent person does not go to prison. Because if the prosecutors and law enforcement and those corrupt politicians cannot prove it beyond the shadow of a doubt, and I don't mean their version of shadow of a doubt, circumstantial evidence means nothing if you can't back it up with any hardcore evidence. And when you sit on that jury, you're going to be instructed by the judge. You have to follow these exact rules, and it doesn't matter about this, and it doesn't matter about that. And it doesn't matter if you think that the punishment is right, and if you don't think that the code is right. You have a right 
The jury's power is over this. You can nullify these corrupt codes. That's the power of the jury. The judges don't want you to know that. The prosecutors surely don't want you digging and investigating and finding out more information. I'll tell you one of the things. Everybody has the right to know the nature and cause of, of their crime that they're being charged with. As a jury, or as a juror, why don't you simply ask, because of the nature and cause of the crime, ask them to provide you with the enacting clause for that specific code. Other than the state of Nevada, because they did alter. If there's no enacting clause, there's no law. They're charging you with a code that's not even a law if there is no enacting clause. That's the jury's responsibility to find that out. Don't sit there and just be quiet. Ask questions. Do your job. It is you. It is me. It is my neighbors. It is everybody. We are protectors of our own people. Do you think for one second these corrupt people are going to place themselves in check? No, they get paid very well for entrapping and enslaving our people, and they don't care what color you are. Because they get the same amount of money. And they get the same amount of slaves. And yet it's slaves. Because once you're in the prison system, you go in there and you work 8 or $17 a month for full-time work. That's slavery. I don't give a rip who you are. Only when we realize that we are set, what we ourselves are doing wrong and correct our perception of real justice will our union become a better place and our people will have liberty without fear of the corrupt judicial system. The jails will no longer be a burden upon our people. The cost will go down. Our families will be more reunited. And the ever so growing police state will dissipate because it will no longer be profitable for them. Thus, in turn, we will be reuniting our families, strengthening our communities, and reestablishing the liberty that we were originally intended to have. When you strengthen the families, you have less children who are angry. When the state rips apart their family and takes away their mother or their father over eight, and they know they're innocent, and they sit in prison, yeah, they're going to be angry because they know the system is corrupt. Why wouldn't they be angry? We must give to others what we expect to be given unto us. If we as a people do not, then one day the same shall be done to us. And there will be no one to defend you when you are targeted by their unlawful codes, what they call laws. The law of the land is do no harm based off of the Ten Commandments. When you agree to enslave another person over a code, which is not law, you yourself become the aggressor because code does not have the legal authority of law. You then become the one that is harming a person and our union. We must get off of our couches and get our butts into the courtroom so these officials are held accountable for every action that they do. Many times they get by with this because nobody Nobody is sitting in these courtrooms, and the only people that the defendants are surrounded by are the very ones who are wanting to hinge them up. When violations of a person's rights are allowed against one person, it's being done to every one of us. And that is why we must be educated and unite to protect all people's rights. The only way that we can stop this out of control system is if we do it ourselves. Stop waiting the knight in shining armor to come in. We're it. 
through education, knowledge, and putting those things we have learned into action, we can and will restore our republic. And that is my thought for today. So, I have also included many different uh, sites, including if you want to report a color of law issue, you can go to the FBI Federal Law Enforcement Authority announce formation of task force to fight public corruption. Although I'm no fan of the feds. So, let's look at this. Jury gives $1 million to a man who sued the city for false police charges. I want you to hear what this man has to say. But I didn't want to drown neither, so I just kept fighting. When officers pulled the 42-year-old barber over in 2006 in Chicago, he just left his salon. One officer accused him of kicking and spitting on them. But a jury acquitted Collins, and he was released from Cook County in 2007. All I know is <clears throat> I ended up a victim. But the trauma and distress is still with him. And I just was devastated, you know. I, I was just devastated. Since his release, he's worked continuously in this Dalton salon, surrounded by pictures of his sons, Elwood, now seven, who was born while Collins was in jail, and his ex fiance who left him after he went to jail. She said I wasn't the same person. Tonight, Collins says it's been a long, hard road to get here, but he's a step closer to having his whole life back. I'm thankful that someone seen that it was an injustice that needed to be done. Okay. So he lost his fiance because the police falsified police report and he went to jail. And he literally set up by these police officers went to jail, lost his fiance, missed the birth of his children. <clears throat> and yeah, he's getting money back, but do you think he'd rather have the money or do you think he'd rather have a normal life and them have left him alive? Are these police officers that did that, are they going to be charged? Are they going to prison? That's the problem. Because the, and I'm not referring to good police officers. The police officers who are corrupt and continue to do this stuff get a slap on the wrist. They get paid vacation, also known as paid administrative leave, while the investigation goes on. They might get fired. They have destroyed a man's life. They have taken things from him he will never get back. And these police officers never go to jail. They are not above the law. They are no different than us. They simply slip on a blue suit or a tan suit or a black suit and they carry a badge and they think that that makes it where they're not charged. Why weren't these police officers charged? He spent 385 days in jail, people, due to the false charges of aggravated battery to a police office, officials said. That is perjury. Perjury has time that goes along with that. I know in the state of Ohio, for just perjury under oath, you can get five years in prison if it's proven 
It's obviously been proven in this man's case. Why aren't they in jail or in prison for perjury? If more of these officers that are corrupt would be charged and tried and stuck in the same daggone prison population that they so gladly love to throw everybody else under the bus for, I guarantee you they'd start being honest and straightening up. And I am not anti-law enforcement. I am anti-corruption. I know many great officers, hardcore constitutional, and those I support. But I will never support corrupt police officers, judges, prosecuting attorneys, and public defenders that work together to lie, manipulate, and do anything they can do to get that paycheck. only way we're going to be able to take back our union and give our people the liberty that we need is we must stand up, we must be educated, we must already know those rules because those judges are not going to tell you them. We must not allow them to manipulate us anymore because they are causing us to enslave our own people and then they wash their hands of it like, well, the jury said it was guilty. All while the jury was not fully informed of their rights or their duties. All while the jury was not informed, oh, there's no enacting clause for this specific code. Which makes it not a law. I'm going to play, this is from the Three Free Thought Project, and I found this video very powerful. Um, it's a Children of Promise mission video, and I'll include the link. But I think it's important to hear what these children go through because, you know, ultimately, it's our fault. It's not the kids' fault. It's our fault. Because half of us are too worried about Facebook and Twitter and what so-and-so is doing and sticking our nose in everybody else's business instead of minding our own. And that may not be politically correct, but guess what? It's true. But worrying about what everybody else is doing Mind your own business. Take care of your business. Because until you take the sty out of your own eye, you have no right to take one out of someone else's. I'd like to play this for you. It's a five minute video. And then I'll close up. Children of Promise is the only after-school program in New York City that provides tutoring and group counseling to the children of incarcerated parents. Without help, children of an imprisoned parent have a 70% chance of repeating the cycle. There's 105,000 young people in New York State that have an imprisoned parent. Once uh, uh, an adult is incarcerated, there's no agency that's responsible for these young people. Primarily, our activities are therapeutic. We infuse mental health services in all aspects of the program. How many of your parents are serving more than, let's say, 25 years? Fiona, how much time is your father serving? He serving 27. Of Malaysia, how much time? Um, they said my father had 25 years. So Dylan, I'm going to have you start and just, you're not going to say anything, you're just going to take, pick one of the things and then you can pass it down. Okay, so why don't you guys go ahead and open them up. 
and you're going to read the question. The thing that is hardest for me about having a parent in jail slash prison is... So, Ziana. Last time I visited my father, it was, it was like a long time ago. And every time like I go see him, we have like a long conversation. And then like when the time is up and I go, I, like I just start crying. Like, like, and I don't stop crying until like I go home. He write me letters, but sometimes I don't get to respond back. Sometimes I don't feel like it because I, I like, I can't write everything in a letter. I have to like talk to you or see you as long as I can talk to you. Like you mean a lot to me. If I could see you, you mean so, uh, so much to me. I only have my mother, but I don't have my father. And it just hurts so bad. Here we have a poem that uh, one of our teens, Terea, actually wrote this. And it's to Daddy. And it said, uh, I saw a man walking down the street. He looked familiar. I was not sure who he was, but then I remembered. He was my father. I walked up to him to say hello. He replies, who are you? I say, you really don't remember me? Your own flesh and blood? And I walk away. He stops me and he says, where are you going? I said, sorry, I don't know you anymore. You know, and when I, when I see work like this for our young people, it's very compelling because that's why the organization exists. So that Terea could write something like this and feel very comfortable in expressing, you know what, my dad served a number of years and he came home and he doesn't know me. I want you to write about obstacles or limitations that you faced and some also that you've gotten past. Ray Ray, I saw your hand fly up. Ray Ray Maldonado's father and grandfather have both spent time in prison. Children of Promise hopes to break that cycle. One obstacle that I have been through was when my father went to jail when I was five years old. It was very depressing for me because I was the oldest and, and plus I had a brother, a sister to take care of. He had recently came out about three weeks ago and he's trying to get his life back together. But mostly he's trying to get his life back together with me and my brother and my sister. Children of Promise is somewhat of a savior. It's a savior because the people here are actually directly affected by incarceration, which tends to lead them to have a greater probability of, of going to jail. We probably wouldn't even begin to fathom what kind of life we would have without this place. I've been here since the first day of Children Promise. The first. I know that Everyone that was in the program had the same situation as me. They had someone that they knew, they loved, they cared for, incarcerated. Children of Promise has taught me that I have other people, you know, to care for me, just not my father, but I have other people to care for me. Like, everyone in here, they're caring for me. There's this population that is underserved and so at risk, and there's finally an organization that's addressing it and helping them break the cycle. Okay. So my question is this, and I ask that you really think about this. We've got people being incarcerated over drugs and drug dealing, yet the government has been caught bringing it in and issuing it out. You've got people incarcerated for murder. And as you saw the statistics and the stuff that all four or five or five of below, below the video, 74% false confessions. Yet our government mass murders people across the globe. They arm terrorists. They fund ISIS. They help what is people call the moderates or FSA, which is ISIS and Al Qaeda. Same thing. 
created by our government way back when, originally known as the Mushahadi. Our government puts people in jail for gun running or for unlawfully carrying weapons or selling weapons, all while the Department of Justice and the ATF themselves were running guns and involved with Fast and Furious, which made sure that these weapons got into the hands of the Sonola drug cartels, which are known for their mass violence and their murdering. Hundreds of people on the Mexico side have died. Innocent people have died from those fast and furious guns on the Mexican side. Several on the side of the United States. And I'm sure there's many more to come. The federal government and the state governments tromp on every right that we have whether it be freedom of speech, whether it be the Fourth Amendment with a search warrant, whether it be the police state martial law, whether it be targeting American citizens instead of terrorists. They are aiding and abetting our enemy. That's high treason. None of these politicians are going to prison. None of them are being charged with high treason. That's the only way this terrorism, this global terrorism is going to stop in the first place. But all these politicians and every one of these individuals who are enforcing these codes that are not law are guilty and much more so than any person sitting, and I mean any person, including Charles Manson, of murder, of drug dealing, of arms trafficking. But we're allowing them to enslave our people by it. And the whole question is, do you truly believe in innocent until proven guilty? With your self-reflection, ask yourself that question. Be honest with yourself. And if you have been woken up to realize that you thought you believed in that, but in reality you don't, change it. Only you can change yourself. It's not for anybody else to change you. And when you change yourself, inevitably you will change others. Because of your stand. And in that, we will protect our union. I hope that you give this video a serious thought. I know it's kind of long. I apologize for that. This is deep in my heart. We the people are allowing this, and only we the people can stop it. Thank you for listening. Please give me a thumbs up if you like the video. Thumbs down if you do not. Leave your comments in the section below. God bless you, and until next time, Semper Fi.